Uh, welcome everyone to Taproom Tastings for February. Happy Valentine's Day. We're glad you could join us uh, today to uh, talk all about bread. So I'm Catherine Prescott, mm -hmm. the Chief Curator uh, at Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center. And joining me as always is Mary Saltis Ottomanelli. Uh, and we are very excited. We've learned a lot about bread um, mm -hmm. as one of the oldest human made foods. It has become a staple for most of the world. Um, and so there's quite a lot to talk about and people had lots of thoughts on bread. Um, some, <laughs> lots of thoughts. Some not based in fact. Um, but I love that you said it was one of the oldest produced foods. So when I started looking, everybody likes to introduce, when we look at these topics, it's always like, well, where is it? come from? What's the origin? Sometimes it's impossible, but you have an idea. Um, when Catherine says this, I want to show you, there are model bakeries and breweries in ancient Egyptian tombs. Um, it reminded me of this because there's little tiny figurines in all of these, in not necessarily pharaohs, but like upper class people who had all of these kind of bigger tombs. My ancient Egyptian is not good, you guys. I study 18th century. Um, but these little tiny makeshift bakers and breweries because you were supposed to be provided with bread for eternity, which I thought was so cool. And they're like little tiny dollhouse sizes. And it, it goes, to, I mean, the one on the left is incredible because there's little tiny breads that they're making. It's just, I, I'd never seen anything like that. And then my second favorite one was the fact that they found bread from Pompeii. Uh, and the recipe, the bread was a round sourdough bread, and it was segmented into eight pieces with the center, with a hole in the center of the loaf. And they were excavating pieces from Pompeii, and they found it in that oven that you can see on your right. And if you Google Pompeii bread, because technology is incredible and science is an in incredibly like high tech world that we live in, they were able to take fragments of these breads that they found and do testing on them and pull out the ingredients. So you can actually recreate the Pompeii bread because the recipes exist on the internet. They're all kind of different, but I'm pretty sure it's a sourdough based kind of bread. But it was, I was looking through origins of bread and I was, I didn't think I was going to stumble upon a recipe from Pompeii. Like I knew we would go back a little bit, but I, bread exists that old. I thought that was great. Yeah. Just so, had to share that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my research says that um, there's evidence from at least 30,000 years ago. Um, that's when you get like the first bread-like um, things. Um, and it's basically kind of, they think it was some sort of starch that was spread on rocks um, and then baked in the sun as like an early flatbread. Um, but the first like actual bread making dates to about 14,000 years ago in Jordan, in the Levant. Um, and so a lot of the early wheat domestication was happening in that, that site. One of my archeology span professors at college worked on a site where they had like evidence of really early wheat. Um, yeah, so that, I, I just remember him telling us that, uh, in, in class once, um, but yeah, so wheat domestication happens pretty early on, but not actually, um, before bread making. So you start with wild yeast, um, and then the earliest evidence of, uh, wheat domestication, uh, comes from about 10,000 nine nine thousand six hundred years so you've got like five thousand years before um anyone's domesticated wheat um and most of the wheat strains that are used today uh are the same ones that were domesticated the species were the same ones domesticated way back uh in 10,000 bc so you know we always hear about ancient grains and wheat is one of the most ancient. There's the joke. 
I think this might be one of the oldest that we've been able to trace of all the, the taproom tastings we've done. I think so. I mean, beer would be the other one, but beer is usually wheat or barley. So kind of there's that connection. Yeah. Beer and bread are very closely intertwined. Um, when we talk about yeast and leavening, I'll get more into that. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> um, but I guess the first thing we want to kind of identify is what is bread, right? And at its most basic, bread is flour and water. Um, yeah. But most people consider bread to be flour, water, yeast, and salt. Um, so most cultures have a leavened bread that uses yeast. Mm -hmm. um, and then unleavened bread-like things are often called different, different words, have different names. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so bread, so what we're talking about today is basically the basic flour, water, yeast, and salt. Um, the flour is usually made out of wheat, but you can use all sorts of grains. Um, and uh, so by the time we get to the 18th century, bread is has become the staple in the diet um, in Europe. And for a lot of people, it was probably the only thing you were going to eat in, on any given day. Um, for a lot of people, your diet consisted solely of bread and ale. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I can say, um, when you're talking about a primary piece of your, your meal and you look at the Dutch bread was one of the major pieces. So when you look at new Amsterdam and you look how the Dutch came in and how they carried that tradition after the English takeover, um, it is such an important piece of how new Amsterdam was was functioning. Um, New York City and Brooklyn become like this, this bread basket because they are just such mass producers of wheat at the time. Um, there are ordinances going back to as early as 1649. I started looking through common council notes as one does for taproom tastings. Um, and there are such regulations on who you can sell to, what you're selling, how much, and we'll talk more about because the regulations of bread, because it was just the most accessible food for a lot of the classes, how regulated it was between both of our neighboring cities in Connecticut and New York City. Um, one of my, the things that I didn't expect to see was the ordinance from November 8th, 1649. So the Common Council bans the selling of white bread to the indigenous tribes in the area. Um, and because they were, the bakers were selling so much wheat and bread to the indigenous tribes that were coming into the trade post, uh, they couldn't feed everybody in the trade post. So they actually stopped. They started this ban and I don't know when it was rescinded, but I don't know if it was also enforced, but it obviously triggered a few people because it shows up in 18 and uh, 1650 again, um, later on in that year. And like, I didn't write down the date, but I think it was like earlier, February, March, April, May, sometime around that time. Um, and they really start cracking down on what kind of bread that you're allowed to sell, how much of it, the weight of it. And that all starts becoming really regulated, um, which is something that I didn't think about. And then as we were doing more research and we were talking more about how we wanted to like structure the lecture we kept going, did you find your prices? Cause I found these prices. What were your prices? Trying to compare and contrast what New York city looked like with Connecticut during different time. And they're all around the same price, but I didn't expect it to be this. And it was regulated. I mean, the latest I found was mid 20th century where the regulations on the, the size and weight of bread in, in the United States as a whole. Yeah, regulation of, of both wheat and bread um, happens very early. I think in England, it's like the 1200s is when they first start mm -hmm. regulating. And um, 
it's because bread was such an important part of people's diets uh, and, and like the only part of a lot of people's diets. And so the government basically limited or put um, tied the price of bread to the price of wheat and basically limited how much profit a miller or a baker could make um, on that. And then they also regulated the different types of bread that could be sold and um, how big each loaf was, right? Um, and so I, I know in kind of the health food world, we're always talking about white bread versus brown bread. And this is a conversation that has been happening for millennia probably, but okay. I, at least I could find like centuries <laughs> to the 16, 1700s. Um, because the white bread is made out of flour that has had the brand, the wheat bran removed from it. So, um, and that makes it, it's more finely ground. It's more expensive because it requires additional processing. So it was what wealthier people could afford. Whereas if you were poor, you could not afford such highly processed flour. And so you're going to get, you know, whole wheat, which still has the bran on it, and that's going to make a brown bread, right? Um, and so, of course, everyone wants to be able to buy the white bread because it shows that you have the, the income for that. Um, and so throughout the, the, the centuries, you see doctors, especially pushing back or doctors who knows what their qualifications are. Um, and you see them pushing back and talking about how brown bread and how the bran in the bread is supposed to be better for you or healthier for you, trying to get people to kind of go back to eating, um, the, the brown bread or what was called household bread. That was like the lowest level you could get um, whole wheat. And they would claim all sorts of things, but basically the, the idea was the bran because it, it doesn't, it's not really digestible and it's coarser. It's supposed to like scour your gut and like clean out your gut um, and any blockages that might happen. Um, so it was apparently that a lot of doctors are saying that, you know, whole wheat bread, brown bread is good for um, constipation and things like that. Um, but yeah, so that was something I thought was really interesting is that that discussion, you know, has been happening for so long. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think either of us realize the connection of this like health food industry in the United States. And it's really strange connection to bread and that conversation of every 50 years it's white bread brown bread white bread brown bread which one's better for you and why and I know like when as you were saying like white bread was such a staple uh and like a symbol for upper class because they can afford something like this um it was a sign of religious purity too. I mean, it went with like hygiene rules. Like if you can afford white bread, you were pure, you were hygienic, you were rich, you were, you, you were this patriotic American almost. Um, and if you couldn't afford it, you were just like, kind of like looked down upon and then you can see it switch back. And I was able to find, um, statistics because I was interested in watching that, like every couple of decades switch it was not until 2010 for the first time whole wheat was the most purchased type of bread in the, in the United States. It took till recently. I mean, in the scope of what we're talking about, I say a decade. Um, but seeing those go back and forth and then reading about the major players involved with those who were pushing that health food movement and what was going on, because these are great, these are these are names that you know. Um, it was I mean, our favorite, I think that we looked at was Sylvester Graham of the Graham Cracker and how he was this like leader. I think one of those poets, poets called him like the father of like health in like the 1830s and 1840s when he was at his height of popularity. I think it was Emerson. I don't know. I saw a quote and I was like, I don't know if I believe this, you know, 
the internet. I didn't have a chance to look it up, but it did track a little bit. Um, yeah, our favorite Sylvester Graham, who invented Graham, invented Graham bread. Like he took a recipe and he ran with it. Um, but it was essentially another recipe for brown bread. And I was able to find one. So I can pull that up as we talk about him a little bit more. Um, fascinating human being. Uh, yeah. So Sylvester Graham wrote this really interesting um, pamphlet. It's called A Treatise on Bread and Bread Making uh, in 1837, I believe. Um, it is a trip reading it. Um, but my favorite quote is from the preface. It's like the second sentence. Um, but basically he says, uh, thousands in civic life will eat the most miserable trash that can be imagined in the form of bread um, and never seem to think that they could possibly have anything better. And then he spends the rest of this treatise, it's like a hundred some pages, uh, on basically that bread is such a big part of the human existence that you, he knows that you can't get rid of bread, um, but he thinks that unleavened whole wheat brown bread, basically whole wheat crackers is what he's advocating for, um, is what everybody should be eating, um, which is, you know, when you think about it, graham crackers are kind of along that line. Um, have Still delicious. Bread. Yeah. Um, but he claims that this great unleavened brown bread um, can not only, uh, like doctors from before him, uh, can not only cure constipation, but can also cure diarrhea. So, you know, either problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he was a Presbyterian uh, minister, I was reading up on how he was able to kind of propel himself into popularity and become this it was a mix of like a Tony Robbins like person who goes out on the road mixed in with like a mega church speaker almost like the power that this man had wherever he went people listened people followed and with the with the rise of technology and newspapers and he's able to print these these books and he was able to print these newsletters and he had a magazine at one point in time where he had contributing authors come in um and the link to so many different movements so the health food industry that and the diet reform industry essentially what he's proposing but like diet and like a none of you are actual scientists kind of a thing um it was linked to the temperance movement abolition diet reform um, all part of the second great awakening that was happening in the 1830s up until about the antebellum outbreak of the civil war-esque situation. So you had this really big 40, 50 year period of a bunch of people telling you that what you ate directly responded to how you lived, how you presented yourself, what was wrong with you, how you can cure your ailments. Um, and he was a big, uh, believer of the vegetarian diet of whole grains, graham cracker. You can see the graham bread, brown bread uh, recipe that I have here on the right, which was uh, taken from another magazine that he had endorsed or like spoken about. Um, so with that diet, you are also avoiding meat, spices, condiments, and complex preparations of food. Um, and that was like, I don't understand. Like again, quasi- quasi fake scientist trying to tell you what to eat. You weren't allowed to have alcohol uh, and you were supposed to be bathing regularly. So there was some of it based in like hygienic proponents, which we hadn't really seen before of things that we do today. Um, but he believed all of this would reduce uh, excessive sexual desires, which essentially was part of that temperance movement, was part of the Presbyterian and like very religious movements at the time. Um, and it was a way for you to cure, like Catherine said, a multitude of illnesses through your diet, which, you know, you eat healthy, you should be healthy. It's not too far off from the truth. Um, but the way that this was preached and the way that this was performed in front of a lot of people was very anti all the yummy food that I would call. Um, there's nothing wrong with bread. I feel like I have to say that out loud to everybody tonight. Bread is not your enemy unless you have celiac disease. And even then, gluten-free bread is delicious. I've had it all. Um, but I, I was, as we were doing research, I had given my daughter like a graham cracker and I went, 
I didn't know this before. And now I look at them a little differently. Uh, but there was also Graham and Kellogg of Kellogg Cereal was also another like health movement person. And him and his brother got into a fight about the recipe of the Kellogg cereal that we know today. Um, yeah, it's a lot of people you don't think and are brands today that are rooted in anti-bread movements, kind of. I, we didn't know we were going to stumble upon this, so I'm glad everybody's learning this with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so far, we've kind of just been talking about wheat breads um, because that was the most popular. Um, the thing I did learn about wheat is for a staple crop, it is very um, finicky. And uh, for something that is meant to feed you know, most of the world. Uh, it doesn't grow well if it's too hot or too cold or too wet or not wet enough. Um, and so there is a lot of cases when harvest failed or they were just, you know, the the wheat was not as good quality. And so um, people would always do kind of mixed grains, um, go to look to different grains uh, to make their bread. Um, rye was the biggest one uh, for most of Europe and, and, and kind of Euro, Euro American um, cultures. Uh, and yeah, then the poorest people who couldn't even afford like that household whole wheat brown bread uh, might go for a, a rye bread um, or a mixed rye and wheat bread. Um, so there are a lot of those kind of uh, recipes that have shown up, um, but also at various times when uh, when there's been wheat shortages, people have come up with all sorts of ways to extend your wheat supply. Um, so all these different types of things you can mix in to your wheat um, to try. And the idea was to mix something in that extends the 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 wheat usually a starch, um, but that you're not going to taste, right? So you want the bread to taste as much like a white loaf as possible. Um, and so one of the ones, I found a couple um, that I'll share here. Um, here, uh, I have two, uh, the two on the, the left, uh, come from uh, a family um, or a housewife's family companion by William Ellis uh, in 1750. So this is a British cookbook. Um, and he talks about one way you can keep your bread um, fresh longer is to actually, instead of water, use um, pumpkin liquor is what he calls it. But basically you take a pumpkin and you boil it and then you use the water from boiling the pumpkin. So the sugars and stuff and some of the pumpkin starch probably ends up in that water. Use that to make your bread. Um, and it is supposed to keep your bread uh, longer, make it last longer. Um, so you can see at the, the bottom, it says, uh, one author says it makes an excellent sort of bread. And another says it is more especially so for those who desire cooling. Uh, being good to loosen the belly. Uh, it is somewhat of a yellower color and fatter than common bread. So that was one kind of way to do bread. Um, and then we have potato bread, uh, which, I mean, you can still find potato bread in the, the grocery store today. Uh, and that's basically you use uh, half wheat flour and half mashed potato. Um, you cook the potato, mash it up and mix it in. Uh, and then another one I, I found uh, here is turnip bread. Uh, this is from uh, England as well, 1757. Uh, and I've highlighted the, the actual instructions. But I do like at the very end, he says, this turnip bread was not to be distinguished from common bread, either to the eye, taste, or smell, except to very nice palates, who perceived a small flavor of the turnips. 
Um, so that was kind of uh, how uh, how you can make your your bread uh, be extended. Uh, and then, of course, in the United States uh, or the colonies, uh, they had another grain that they could use, um, corn, maize. Uh, one of the things I actually, kind of a side note, one of the things I learned is that uh, corn, the word corn in British English um, and kind of early on meant the grain of any cereal crop. Um, and so oftentimes you see these old uh, writings and they talk about corn, but they're not actually talking about maize, American corn. They're talking about the grain from wheat or barley or whatever. Um, and so that's why in the 18th century, you often see maize referred to as Indian corn um, because it is the, the corn, the grain of the Indians um, at the time. And then we just kind of shortened it to corn and forgot all about the other grains. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that kind of tripped me up a little bit until I figured it out. Um, but in the United States, uh, in, in North America, there was corn, um, that could be used. And when the first settlers arrived in the colonies, uh, it took a while to get wheat to grow. They had to figure out how to, to best get wheat to grow in this new climate. Because as I said, wheat is actually very finicky. Um, and so they, they survived a lot on corn and cornbreads. Um, but as soon as the, the colonists were able to grow enough wheat, the corn was done. Um, unless they really had, <laughs> um, unless they were really forced to, uh, it was wheat bread, um, or rye bread. Um, and uh, though sometimes they did when there were shortages in grain, again, to make your, your flour last longer, they would mix cornmeal in. Um, so a popular, I, I don't know about popular, but a common bread um, in the 18th century was what's called rye and Indian. Um, or rye and Indian corn, which was uh, actually a third rye, a third wheat, and a third cornmeal. Um, and that kind of makes a... Um, a I wonder how red. dense that would be. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I've, I watched a couple of videos of people making them on YouTube, and they look pretty dense. Like, the dough itself is not... I mean, corn doesn't have gluten in it. So like mm -hmm. cornbread doesn't make bread like we think of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it looked very dense. But everybody, when they're tasting it in their videos, I mean, who knows how good their acting is. Uh, they seem to <laughs> like it. <so. laughs> um, but Therese asked, uh, were they making cornbread as we know it? Um, sort of. Uh, the early cornbreads did not have any leavening in it. Um, and, and I can talk a little bit more about leavening in a second, but basically the cornbreads were much denser, kind of flatter, um, because they didn't, baking powder and baking soda were not invented until the 1840s, um, so they weren't as light and fluffy uh, as we know cornbread today. Um, and actually one of the things that cornbread has since become uh, associated with uh, more of Southern cooking. Um, and part of that is because, you know, enslavers were not shelling out the money to buy wheat flour for uh, the, ins the, the enslaved. Um, they were feeding their enslaved people corn. Uh, but also wheat just doesn't grow as well. It's too wet in Southeastern United States. Um, basically any farther South than Virginia, um, wheat doesn't really grow well. And so corn uh, corn and cornbread have since become kind of more associated with the South um, than with New England, which is, you know, kind of the first, because now we just have cornbread like Thanksgiving. It's one of those Thanksgiving foods that are true. I was going to say. Right. Um, so, 
Uh, yeah, but corn, you know, was was out as soon as they could get wheat. Dale, A. Dale said, we fry cornbread in the South. In North Carolina, we can grow decent wheat, but off season for other locations. Yeah, um, I think that goes back to archaeology wins again. Um, one of my archaeology friends was telling us about the glaciers. So we're going back to not 18th century, way, way, way back. Um, and the fact that there was a glacier right uh, around the New York, New England area. So when it melted, it made all of the soil so nutrient dense and a perfect uh, environment for wheat to grow, which is why you get so much in New York. And New Jersey ends up doing a decent amount as well. Um, but one of the oldest mills, I will say, is by where I grew up on the southern tip of, in the southern corner of Brooklyn. Um, on low tide, you can still see some remnants of it from the 1600s. Um, I found some pictures. Uh, so this is the Garrison Mill in Southern Brooklyn. Um, you can, whoops, I saw that one. Oh no, there. Um, so uh, this is from the early 1630s when the Dutch started settling around the Southern areas of Brooklyn. So this is the Garrison Mill you can see uh, and then just a picture of what it would look like. So all of that wheat was being grown in that area. Um, large, large, large plots of, of wheat were being grown there and they would take it to the Garrison Mill and the Dutch started using water power to be able to mill all of those ingredients to be able to like um, just get everything out faster because they were selling it back, the Dutch were selling it back to the English, they were selling it to the natives and then they were shipping them out to their colonies because they had to feed the enslaved people, um, which is where a lot of it went. But you can still see that the mill existed in 1922. It burned down mysteriously as all fires start. Um, but on a low tide, you can still kind of see the remnants of the pillars that were never removed, um, which is really cool. And you don't you don't appreciate these things until you're an adult and you're into history, because when you're a kid, you're like, OK, cool. It doesn't mean anything. And then I'm like, isn't this so cool? It still exists. It's great. It's amazing. Um, but New York City has this very lar large tie. Um, I do want to share how much we love wheat is that the seal was changed in 1654 from just showing beaver pelt on the left to barrels of wheat on the right um, and how important it was to our economy and how important it was to the things that we were doing as a state. Um, well, 1654 as a colony at that time. Uh, but again, it's one of those things that you look at in high school and you're like, okay, yeah, I've seen the seal. And then you start picking apart the windmill and the beaver pelts and the barrels of wheat um, and the indigenous representation and the eagle and the pilgrim guy, the Dutch guy, wherever we are at at that point in time. And you're like, oh, symbols mean things. I get it now. Um, but the Dutch were really into their bread. I do want to point out how much um, I went down a hole of artwork. Uh, poor Catherine has seen all of these already. <laughs> um, but little boy holding a basket of, of assortment of bread from 1650. This woman went to the market and she picked up this huge loaf of bread. There's a whole story behind this. Um, she's over in the corner listening to the gossip from the two women on the other side on the left side. Uh, you could see like a chicken duck situation hanging out of her bag, but the size of that bread loaf is outrageous and looks delicious. Um, and then as we were talking about Graham and the tie to religious purity and white bread and dark bread, how these things and how pieces of art were so symbolic. Um, so the symbolic props have been placed in a very specific manner. Um, I did take this from the Louvre. Uh, bear with me. It was a French translation. Um, but all of these things have very specific meanings, um, which I thought was so cool because I'd never thought about this, right? Regarded music is regarded as morally corrupt and in opposition to the Eucharist symbols of bread and wine, which tie back to religion and body of Christ when they give you crackers and 
so many things. One of my favorites, the baker blows his horn to announce that fresh bread is ready. Uh, the pretzels, my favorite. Um, the Dutch take their bread very, very seriously. And you can still see that in New York City um, with the fact that we have like pretzel carts and we take donuts very seriously. This is also one of my favorites as well. Um, this one I think most people will associate with um, when you type in like Dutch bread, this is the one that comes out. And you can see the multiple types of bread that are hanging. I tried to identify as many as I could. Um, so cool. And then I think it's probably worth noting that we talk about how bread was made and the intensive process behind it. This was the best that I can do that kind of showed everything. Um, on the right, you see that trough where they put in all of their dough and it would rise. And these troughs are, I mean, the size of a regular desk. They're huge, right? Because you were trying to make as much bread as you could for the household to last you as many days as you could. Um, you can see on the right, on the left side, excuse me, that it looks like one giant loaf, um, absolutely huge. And then in the middle, you see all of the women working and the domestic labor that goes into all of this and the food preparation that's necessary to feed the family at all times. I think that might be it. Yeah, that's, those are all of the images I have. But I know when I had come on site a few weeks ago when we were looking at your hearth, we discovered the beehive oven. Uh, on the side, and we were kind of like, interesting, we should look into this just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and we were the two, just two historians looking, our whole heads were just in the hearth going, it's original, that's really cool. I wonder what they made in here. Yeah. Uh, they made bread, <laughs> little tiny, like individual sized loaves of bread yeah. were in that hearth. Yeah. So that was one of the things that I'm kind of still interested in figuring out because the um i am currently sitting in the tap room uh, of keeler tavern what was the tap room and mary is in front of a picture of um the the quote unquote new kitchen that was done in 1823 um and just off to the right uh is, is where the the beehive oven is in that that kitchen um and that has like kind of a I would say normal size beehive oven that you would think of when you think of a beehive oven. Um, the the one behind me, if you can see, I have my fake bread in there, kind of marking it, um, is surprisingly small, and I never really thought about it before. Um, it's I, I measured it, and it's twenty one inches deep by thirty three inches at its widest and it's like a half circle. So it's not very big at all. You can't make a very large loaf of bread in it. No. Um, and so that got me thinking like Esther Keeler, who was using this hearth to feed her family and tavern guests is not baking bread in that, that oven. Um, and so that got me into like, uh, looking at professional bakers and uh was there a baker in Ridgefield which I'm I I think there had to have been um I don't know who that was yet um I will keep looking uh because there's just no way that we're feeding the whole tavern in a tiny um oven that could probably fit maybe like two modern size loaves um from the grocery store so uh so yeah so but professional bakers and commercial bakers were a huge you know the really important job in a community and they were in pretty much all communities um and so uh and it, it was highly regulated um there there were bakers guilds um, and I did discover that uh, in France, you had to go through until 1864, sometime in the 1860s, you had to belong to the Baker's Guild um, to be able to bake and sell bread. Um, and uh, that required a seven year apprenticeship and a five year journeyman ship. Um, Oh. So, yeah, so in France, at least until 1864, baking was not an open career path, you know. Um, so, yeah, so Ridgefield 
had to have had a baker. Um, I'm, uh, I'm thinking, and that then got me into Timothy Keeler's ledgers, um, to see what kind of, you know, was he, um, dealing with any of the grains that are being made into bread. Um, and so I went into quite a deep dive. Um, and I did find that there was wheat um, being that was coming in. People were bringing wheat into the to the tavern or the store to pay off uh, some of their debts. Um, so they were using these as as credit essentially. And so you can see everywhere there's a a yellow mark. Uh, there's an entry of wheat. And this is in 1774. Um, and I pulled some of them out so you can see uh, Gamaliel Northrup is bringing two bushels of wheat. Um, and we have here a peck of wheat, uh, two and a half bushels of wheat, um, things like that. But then something starts to happen. You see wheat and corn pretty frequently in 1774. Uh, but then come the late 1780s, you see fewer and fewer entries of wheat. You see more of corn. I mean, there had been corn kind of all throughout, but you then you start to get rye uh, and oats and um, buckwheat as well. Um, so you can kind of see there is wheat, um, but this entry actually has rye at the top, which is spelled R-I-E. Um, in the ledgers, they spell it both R-I-E and R-Y-E. Uh, we also have a bushel of corn here. Here's some wheat and oats. Um, and then by 1791, this entry right here um, under Scribner, Isaac Scribner, is uh, November of 1791 is pretty much like the last entry of wheat I could find. And our ledgers go into the 1800s. Um, and so here are some from 1791 where we get buckwheat. Um, and then another 1791, here's oats. And then all the way in 1804, um, this is actually an, an interesting thing because this is the debits. Uh, you can see people are actually coming to the store, to the tavern to buy rye. Um, so we have people coming to buy half a bushel of rye, um, a bushel of corn, a bushel of rye. And so that I started trying to figure out like, was there something going on in the climate at the time that meant people had to start buying grain from, from the store? Um, oops. But um, yeah, but there is this kind of disappearance of wheat in the ledgers. And I was thinking, you know, there's kind of all sorts of possible reasons why. Um, and I was thinking a couple of my hypotheses are that um, after the revolution, and especially in the, the latter half of the 1780s and 1790s, there were consistent shortages of wheat in France and England. And North America became a huge exporter of wheat to, to Europe um, to cover that shortage. And so are people just, are the farmers selling it for export? And then it's, it's not going through Timothy, it's going through, through someone else. Um, or they're just selling directly to the mills or the baker um, and not, not going through Timothy. Timothy is involved in a lot of businesses in Ridgefield, but perhaps not the grain mill or the bakery. Um, but something happens in the, the early 1790s where wheat just disappears out of the Keeler account books. Um, but I would love to, I don't know, find some other Ridgefield account books that might shed some light. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a mystery. Uh, this has been plaguing her for a month, <laughs> just so everybody is aware. Uh, the frustration every time we meet is, I, 
we've come up with some wild conspiracy theories as to why there's no wheat. Uh, but Teresa asked, do you know if the tavern had an outbuilding kitchen, which is not something I think we've discussed before? Um, that is a good question. As far as we know, uh, there was not a separate kitchen. Um, there hasn't been any archaeology done on the site, uh, but there's been so much change um, to the, the site that any archaeological evidence of an outbuilding like that probably wouldn't exist. Um, but there's no kind of anecdotal or written evidence that there was an out, outbuilding, which doesn't mean there wasn't, but um, it's, a, it's a good question and it, it's a possibility. Um, if yeah. if the Keelers were not getting their bread from the baker, then where are they they making it? Um, so. Yeah, because there's no way that they were producing enough to feed a tavern of people with that with that be even if they had something closer to the fire that wasn't in that beehive esque. Yeah, it's uh, the two of us looking at the hearth, going, "Hmm, <laughs> yeah. what can we do with this?" Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, our cons we just kept going back and forth. And my thing was maybe that they had bartering, which is what you found, or debts or anything else like that. Or they were just getting it from New York because it was right there and he could get it. And, and New York was just such a powerhouse of wheat production and, and flour at that point that maybe that's where it was coming from. But I'm sure... As with all small historical societies, they will unearth one document that's like, this is why there was a shortage. And it's something that hasn't been taken yeah. out of a file box in the last 45 years that will calm everybody's nerves. <laughs> yeah. And Cheryl does mention there is um, a second oven in what we call the Hoyt parlor, um, mm -hmm. which is like kind of the original um, room that was constructed, the first room of the house that was constructed. Um, but Cheryl, that that oven is also pretty small. Um, so, I mean, it's possible. And I think Esther could have baked bread here. Um, it's just, you know, seems- Not at the volume. Yeah, not at the volume that I think would have been needed. Um, but what we do have in the collection related to bread, we have a oh. number of, um, are our toasters. Um, so I've got toast a toaster here, um, which as I tell the kids who come to visit us, if you look into your modern toaster, it looks pretty much the same. Um, like if you took a, all the plastic off of it. Uh, and I have a bunch more toasters. They all look... <laughs> pretty much the same, but I do like, um, because there is one that has heart, the heart design oh. on it. So you can see here, there's a heart for Valentine's day. Um, but they, these, um, toasters, you basically, you put your slices of bread in, you face it to the fire and then they all rotate. Um, the, the ones that are kind of sit flat, uh, they actually just spin around on a, a pivot point. And then you have this one with the long handle that just the handle is on a hinge. So it you can flip it um, from one side to the other. And you just phase it towards the fire until your toast was nice and however dark you wanted it. Um, so I thought that the have toast you tried, was fun. Have you tried any of your toasters? I've not because they all have um, rust on them. It all, you know, kind of rusty. So I uh, don't really want to put toast in there. Um, you know, I'm just curious to see how that pattern would be able to. Yeah, I wonder if it gets steered in because they're they're cast, they're iron. So I, yeah. I they would sear in. Um, yeah, that would be really cool to test out. Um, oh man, bring back toasters with designs. Does that a thing? I'm going to look into that. I think it's so. got to be. Yeah. TJ Maxx exists. It's got to be a thing. <laughs> um, so we have a little bit over five minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, um, please drop them in the chat. Um, but I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about leavening. Uh, uh I went <laughs> down a very, very deep rabbit hole on uh, how how they leavened bread um, and ye the yeast 
the, uh, that was used because I guess I always just assumed either they knew what yeast was or they just used wild yeast, right? That you can propagate yeast. Um, I did discover that in the 18th century, they did not know exactly what yeast was. Um, and they didn't know that you could, that there was just yeast everywhere, that you could propagate it out of the wild. Um, so yeast was the main leavener for bread. Um, and uh, there were there are two strains of yeast that were used in the 1700s. Um, there was ale yeast, which is used but for brewing and also for bread. And then the Germans had a separate, a different yeast called lager yeast um, that works for brewing, brewing their, their lager. Um, but basically what most people did is you went to the brewer and you got what was called barm. Uh, barm, come, it's the yeast that rises to the top in fresh ale that's like the foamy soupy stuff um it would be scooped off uh and you would take the baker would take it or you would go if you're baking for your family and get barm um and you feed it a little bit of uh flour just like you would like sourdough starter um and then you would mix it into your bread uh that would give your bread kind of a, a beery flavor and if they were using hops it would kind of be a little hoppy so there were recipes for how to um, kind of wash your barm to get some of that hoppy acidic, you know, tartness out, um, which is basically just kind of the way you feed sourdough starter. Like you feed it, you let it sit, and you water it down a little bit, you feed it some more. Um, but you would just use barm that way. Uh, the other way, and the British preferred using barm. The French had a different way of doing it. Um, they used what's called leaven, which is just a chunk of dough from their last batch of baking. So you'd save it. Um, and you would then kind of mix it with water and then uh, to waken the yeast up again. And then you would uh, mix it into your, your current batch. And then you'd save a bit of that. And, um, and then the older that kind of leaven became the sour, the more sour it got. And that's kind of, it's your base, they're basically making sourdough um, whenever they're baking bread. Um, but these leavens, you could actually dry them out and store them in salt and they would last for months. Um, and there were also recipes available on how to make your barm last if you need to preserve it. So you like spread it out very thin, let it dry and spread more and kind of layer it. And then you could keep it for months and months and months. And I think there was a report of somebody had like barm um, that was some, there was somebody who's still using barm that was like a hundred years old um, because it had, they, it had just dried out and then you can kind of wake it up and then dry it out again. Um, that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of, uh, the two ways that you would leaven your bread. Um, and it wasn't until the very, very end of the, uh, 18th century that people started using, um, chemical leaveners. And the first one used was potash, um, which is made, uh, from burning, burning wood. Um, and you mix it with water and it becomes lye and people use it in soap and glass making. Um, but the Dutch realized that they could also add it to their gingerbread and it made a nice fluffy <laughs> gingerbread. And so they actually brought it to New Netherlands. Um, and the people of the Hudson Valley region, the tri-state area, we're adding potash to their cookies and cakes and breads. Um, and then it was about the 1799 is the first reference I found. And it was actually a woman from Long Island. Her name is Margareta Curley. She wrote a letter to the editor of a London newspaper talking about her American potash cake, also called Long Island pound cake. Um, but it was bread. Uh, and it, they, she used potash or pearl ash, which is a refined version of potash. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so this was kind of well-known knowledge among domestic bakers in uh, the New England, kind of the tri-state Hudson Valley region. Um, and it's only from there that it did it get back to England um, that they could use this pearl ash um, to, to leaven their breads. Uh, and then in the 1830s, 1840s, you get baking soda and baking powder. Um, earlier in the century, some bakers were getting like accidental chemical leavening because uh, the millers were adding chalk to their bread to kind of stretch out the wheat a little bit. Um, and then the miller, the bakers are adding alum, which is an acid. So chalk is a base, um, is an alkali, and alum is an acid. And the, the alum was meant to whiten your loaf, right? So they could sell it for more. But that alkali and acid are acting in the bread together uh, as a chemical leavener. Um, so, so there was some accidental leavening in all of these adulterations that were being added uh, to, to breads, um, mostly in Britain, but also in the United States, people were doing that too. Um, so I noticed Therese had uh, two, uh, two questions. Did you notice a time when they started adding sugar to bread? Uh, that seems to start happening in the 1800s, um, the later ones. Although there were in the, the 1700s, there were recipes I noticed called French breads, um, which were enriched breads. They had milk and eggs in them, um, but not so much sugar. Uh, so you only see the sugar in like the spiced breads, um, and some like the, the cakes that are more like breads, but they call them cakes. Um, and then the beginning of baking soda. Um, so baking soda uh, is actually is sodium bicarbonate and it was originally called sol salaritus. Um, it's from Latin meaning aerating salt. Uh, and that became uh, in common use in the 1800s. Um, the early 1800s, you start seeing references to Solaritus. Um, and then in 1840, uh, baking powder started being used. I can't, I can't remember the exact date, but baking powder is, ba is just baking soda, it's sodium bicarbonate um, mixed in with a powdered weak acid, um, like a, a calcium acid or cream of tartar, uh, that kind of stuff. And so that's why baking powder um, has the, the two parts of that, that um, ingredient, you, uh, the leavening that you need. Uh, whereas when you're using baking soda, generally you add something like buttermilk um, or some kind of acidic substance into your, your baking as you go. Um, yeah, so that that's like a very brief uh, uh, intro to leavening. Um, and actually, if you're interested in the leavening, James Townsend's YouTube channel, <laughs> yeah, a couple of years ago, they did a whole series on leaveners, um, oh, which God. Was, they went real deep in. Um, so that if you're interested, check that out. I was going to say, should that be a taproom tastings? But I, <laughs> if it's been extensively covered by Townsend's, maybe we are hands off on that one. Yeah. Yeah. The, Cause there's some really great stories about, um, especially the the Dutch and using a pot ash and stuff like that. That was, I, you know, they brought me donuts from the 1600s, so I can't say anything. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us tonight for our exploration of bread. Uh, we hope you learned something. Uh, we hope you uh, are even more in love with bread uh, on this Valentine's Day. and. Uh, we, we, we did record this and we, it will be posted, uh, the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow, um, sometime tomorrow. And once it's up, I will email the link to, to everyone who's registered. Um, so uh, have a great night, everyone. And we hope you will join us next month on March 14th. And we are going to be talking about sugar and rum and all of their related uh, things. So 
Uh, yeah, so March 14th, uh, if you're not registered, sign up on our website, keelertavernmuseum.org. All right, so have a great night, everyone.